this here. Good morning. We're officially halfway through the conference. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm seeing a lot of green out there. We have another full day of sessions ahead. Uh, so don't forget to check out actually the conference website for the most up-to-date session schedule. Sometimes there are a few changes that occur. Also, don't forget to check out the exhibitor demonstration schedule uh, for today. During our lunch break, we have a screening of Feeling Through uh, that will be in this room. And come join writer-director Doug Rowland, uh, who will be available to talk about making the film, as well as um, inclusion of people with disabilities, both in front and behind the camera. Bingo was a lot of fun last night. Hope you came and won some great prizes. Tonight, we have karaoke. Come with your list of songs and be prepared to eat and drink. That will also uh, be in this room at 7 p.m. Now for today's featured presentation, disability rights attorney Lainey Feingold is here with us. Uh, she'll share a fast-paced overview of what is happening in the legal space and will give her 2022 legal update. Lainey, thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is very nice to be here at CSUN. <coughs> this is, I already have my sucker and I have my water, so I should be okay. Give me one second. <coughs> um, this, I think, is 22 years since I first started coming to CSUN. I haven't come every single year, but I've come most. And I've done this talk for many years, and I have seen the legal space change, as have you. So um, let's get the slides. Get the slides up. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so I titled this slide, Accessibility is a Civil Right, the 2022 CSUN Digital Accessibility Legal Update. Um, raise your hand or indicate in some way if you have never heard me speak about accessibility as a civil right. Okay, a lot of you, thank you. Thank you, and thanks to those who didn't raise their hand who have been supporters of accessibility as a civil right for a long time. So I'm going to try to uh, share information that's helpful for everyone, wherever you are in the journey. Up on the title slide, I have my name, which is Lainey Feingold. I have my website, which is lflegal.com, and my Twitter handle, which is at lflegal. I wanna tell you quickly how I have the LF Legal brand which is that when I got my first website, I was gonna be laneyfeingold.com, and my friend Josh Mealy, who's at this conference, I think, um, said no one will know how to spell Laney, no one will know how to spell Feingold, and your email address won't fit on your business card in one line of braille. And I listened to Josh, and that has been the secret of whatever success I have in the legal space is because of not just listening to Josh, but listening to blind people, disabled people I've worked with, my clients, fellow lawyers, um, because I work for myself. I've worked at my house by myself for 25 years, even before the pandemic. And I've never had a branding agency, but now like some people think LF Legal, they say like, hi, LF Legal. So um, that's the first message that disabled people are the center of digital accessibility and always to be remembered. Um, I say LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. I happen to be the only Lainey Feingold. I don't know how that happened. And in the background of this slide, you will see a smiling dolphin. And you'll hear more about that going forward, but the big picture, the big takeaway is to be an advocate, to advocate for digital accessibility in the legal space, in your own organizations. You don't have to be a shark. This has been my experience. This is one of the reasons I like to do talks and share that. So um, they kindly gave me a countdown timer and I thank CSUN for giving us a full hour here. I'm gonna to try to save time for questions and I'm gonna pay attention to this bright green uh, 
timer, so thank you. Um, okay, I believe everybody can put the law in their pocket, which is why this is illustrated with a picture of a blue jeans pocket, that front sort of Levi pocket with the front pocket and then the little pocket inside. Well, the little pocket inside was originally developed in the 1800s because people carried pocket watches and they wanted a separate pocket for the watch. But I like this to remind us all that whatever our role in this space, we can talk about the law in an affirmative way, we can use the law to advance accessibility, and we can put little nuggets of legal wisdom into that tiny pocket and share them when we hear, as some of us may have said, including myself, like, oh my God, too many lawsuits, and what's this about, and what's the legal requirements, and my legal department isn't letting me do what I want, is to remember what we're gonna share today and what the title says, Accessibility is a Civil Right. So that's the first thing to put in the pocket, Accessibility is a Civil Right. Um, what we're gonna do today, the roadmap, how we're gonna get there, why are we even talking about law at an accessibility conference, what laws are we talking about, how are they implemented, what to be aware of, and the sad thing is there's many things to be aware of in the legal space, um, how to avoid lawsuits, and how to talk about the law. Now you see why I asked for a timer. That's a lot, but we're gonna do what we can. Okay, two disclaimers. One, no legal advice in this presentation. Um, all my talks and everything on my website is for general information. Everything on my web website is um, Creative Commons. You're welcome to go there and read and take and use in a way that helps advance the accessibility cause but there's no legal advice. So if you need a lawyer, you need to call one. Um, and also, this is an update. This is a legal update. I have the word update emphasized in my contrast color called celery. Um, and I say that because there's a lot of things in the legal space. So I have a resource here, and I'll give you resources throughout. On my website, which is lflegal.com, there's a high-level navigation. Uh, in a room full of accessibility people, I, I, I just want to say menu item. I don't want to identify it past that. Um, <laughs> called, there's a high level menu item called legal update. And I try to write about many of the cases and the legal themes. I started doing that actually after CSUN because when you have a talk like this, a lot of information, hard to you know keep on top of it. So um, you can go to that legal update tab and I have a great way to update it that I just, my web developer just did for me in the last couple months. So if I write about a case, you can always check the updates and see what's happening. So no legal advice and it's an update. So why law? Why law? Let's dive in like these two dolphins diving in. Um, okay, so law is in this space at a conference like CSUN because accessibility is a civil right of disabled people. And I should say at the top, in this presentation, I will interchangeably use people with disabilities and disabled people because there's um, acceptance and adoption and preference in the community for both terms. So if you're not familiar with why some people prefer one versus the other, I recommend you can look it up online and a woman named Emily Ladau has written a great book about disability languaging called Demystifying Disability, so I can recommend that to you. So this is a picture of the Capitol Crawl. Raise your hand if you've never heard of the Capitol Crawl. Okay, this is why I do these talks. Thank you for being here and wanting to hear about the Capitol Crawl. Capitol Crawl actually had the 32nd anniversary two days ago. It was an action before the ADA was passed by disabled people to say, without this law, we have to crawl up the steps of the nation's capital. It was a thousand person demonstration, about 60 people left their wheelchairs at the bottom of the stairs and climbed up. This image shows two of those people. Uh, there's a black woman climbing up backwards on her butt and there's a man crawling up forward. This picture was taken by Tom Olin, O-L-I-N, and he's a documentarian of the disability movement. I invite you to look at his pictures. So I like to start a talk on law with this to remind us of a couple things. One, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed on the advocacy of people with disabilities. It wasn't just some bunch of requirements. People sat around in a room and said, oh, let's put a burden on companies or higher ed or schools. It was, it came from a need for disabled people to be included and 
That is what digital accessibility is about. And too often, legal talks and thinking about the law, that gets lost. So I like to start with a reminder that the ADA is about people and was built on the activism of people. So um, why do we say accessibility is a civil right? Because it's about inclusion, participation, communication, employment, privacy and independence. You know, when I wrote employment on this slide, I said, oh no, I said employment. I didn't say healthcare. I didn't say enjoyment. I didn't say sports. I didn't say five million things that could be put here, but this is a placeholder for accessibility being about all aspects of inclusion, about privacy and independence, because if a person with a disability has to ask for help to do something on a website that you're responsible for, that is breaking the privacy and security that you have worked hard to bake into whatever technology that you are producing. So accessibility is a civil right because it's about privacy and independence. It's about security. And what are the opposite of all those things? Exclusion. So I have a big red X on exclusion because that is a choice we all have. Whatever your role, and I know there's many roles in the organization, and some of you have more power than others to be sure to create accessibility, but whatever your role, you can choose between the inclusion or the exclusion. So accessibility, I like to say, is the difference between this image, which is a closed door, like super closed up with a key lock and a chain and a padlock, and this door, which is open and bringing light. It's about exclusion, it's about inclusion. So that means that accessibility people, which you came to CSUN, so you are that. You are an accessibility champion, whatever your role, you're a civil rights enforcer. You have a choice in everything you do to be creating inclusion or exclusion. And for that, I use the accessibility cookie, which those of you who heard, how many of you have never heard of the accessibility cookie? Okay, this is why I have to do this talk here at CSUN this morning. Um, the accessibility cookie has several functions. We'll talk about another one later. The one here is that these cookies, which are actually baked for a talk I did in New Zealand, have tons of ingredients and look delicious. And they have chocolate chips and they have things on the outside, M&Ms and coconut, and inside they have flour and all this stuff. And, um, I actually had these cookies baked for a talk that I did with Microsoft at a CSUN conference earlier, and we handed out the cookies, so I apologize for not having them today, but you get the idea that there's a lot of ingredients in the cookie, there's a lot of roles, and if we had more time, you know, we could go around and we would have however many people, half as much roles. So whatever your role, you can help enforce the civil rights of people with disabilities by caring about accessibility by going the extra mile. So these are really important ideas, the civil rights, the inclusion, but it's not enough. Civil rights have to be baked into laws, which is why this picture has a cookie dough, because a cookie is not baked until the good ideas of civil rights, which we can all ascribe to, inclusion, participation, until they're baked into laws. So I just wanna go over a couple of the laws that impact accessibility. Um, the first is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the Americans with Disabilities Act is a broad-based civil rights law. And I have two phrases up here on the slide, anti-discrimination and effective communication. And those are fundamental to the ADA, and they're also fundamental to why we're in a room at a AT accessibility conference talking about accessibility. So, you know, you may have heard, I will not ask for hands on this, oh my God, the ADA doesn't say anything about websites. We don't know what to do. But you know, the truth is the ADA has talked about don't discriminate against people with disabilities since the day it was passed. It has required effective communication since the day it was passed. And I have a couple dates up here, um, passed in 1990. In 1996, 1996, the U.S. Department of Justice wrote to a senator who asked a question about accessibility of, quote, web pages, end quote. I had to put it in quotes because it was kind of new. And the ADA Department of Justice said, quote, covered entities under the ADA are required to provide effective communication 
regardless of whether they generally communicate through print media, audio media, or computerized media such as the internet. That was in 1996, computerized media. So that's why I have the 96 up there. In 2000, the United States Department of Justice uh, filed in court in a case, it wasn't about accessibility, but it was about a disabled person using the internet for something. And they filed a brief, uh, you know, legal papers in court. And one of the headings, the first heading says, a commercial business providing services solely over the internet is subject to the ADA's prohibition against discrimination on the basis of disability. Also in 2000, I helped negotiate the very first web accessibility agreement in the United States that used the WCAG 1.0 as a standard. That's 2000. That was 22 years ago. <laughs> that that was, that was 22 years ago. That was an agreement that the blind community, the California Council of the Blind, individual blind people made with Bank America. And I tell the story in my book that we, instead of suing the bank around talking ATMs um, and Braille and large print statements, we use this process that has become structured negotiation. And about three or four years into the negotiation, again, kind of like Josh Mealy telling me I better be LF legal, Roger Peterson and Jerry Coons and some real early adop adopters of technology said to me, okay, Lainey, good job talking ATMs, but there's this new thing, online banking. And if we don't make that accessible, then we are again not gonna have privacy, be locked out of our own money. So we went to Bank America and because we had a relationship, because we hadn't sued them, but rather established a relationship between their disabled blind clients and their own selves, the bankers, Bank of America was like, yeah, we're in. And I'm not saying they signed on the dotted line in the first day, but we got this agreement and um, all the agreements, another high level navigation menu item on my website is settlements. And you can read that first settlement from, from 2000. 2008 was the target case. One of the early cases where a federal judge said, uh, yeah, a website has to be accessible if it's connected to a physical place, like you go on the Target website to look at what's happening in the stores. Target has since become a real champion of accessibility and they've often presented at CSUN. 2012, Netflix case, a judge said, Netflix has to provide captioning even though there isn't a physical place. And now we're at 2022. So I give you that little timeline just to remember when we look at the cases, we'll see that um, yeah, we don't have regulations that say you have to comply with WCAG, but the very foundation of the ADA almost cries out for web mobile technology accessibility because without it, people are excluded and locked out. So what about the WCAG and possible ADA regulations? Well, um, WCAG is not, like I said, a legal requirement under the ADA, although there are other laws where it is. Um, but courts have said, in order to do the anti-discrimination, in order to be effective in communicating with people with disabilities, WCAG is an internationally recognized standard. And the current version of WCAG right now is 2.1AA. So um, on the horizon, the, some disability organizations have written to the Department of Justice asking for specific regulations that say WCAG. And I just want to say, you know, legally, to me, it doesn't so much matter because the ADA itself is so strong and flexible, and there are regulations built into the ADA from the beginning that talk about effective communication and spell out that basically what it's about is making sure anything visually delivered is available to people who can't see. Making sure anything that's audibly delivered is available to people who can't hear. So I know, and the courts have recognized how strong the ADA is, but I also want to recognize that it would be very helpful to those of you in the field and trenches to have a regulation you can point to. So um, the letters online, you can, I think it's either on my website or I know I put it on Twitter, you can look up the NFB sign at the American Council of the Blind to the Department of Justice asking to get the regulations out because if you're a history or regulation nerd, you can look on my website from 2010 when the first regulations were initially proposed. And there's a whole history of that if you're interested. And then there, 
is in, there has been an effort by small business, some small business, to modify the ADA to specifically talk about websites. Um, there's something called the Online Accessibility Act. I call it so-called because if you're interested in this, you can read my thoughts about the law, the proposed law. And, sorry, start again. If you're interested in the Online Accessibility Act, you can read on my website what I wrote about the act and how it actually limits the ADA. And I'm not in favor of amending the ADA at this point in time to include web accessibility for various reasons, including we have a strong law, regulations would be helpful, do we really want to open the ADA up and see what else would come besides what we want? So um, that opinion could change, and again, that's just an opinion. Um, okay, so beyond the ADA, um, here's a pile of books, because when I started, I forgot to say at the beginning, I like to do a visual description, so as I said, my name's Lainey Feingold. Um, for those of you who can't see or who are listening online, and I forgot to say hello to the to the live stream audience out there in the world. Um, and if you're listening by phone or if otherwise you don't see me, I describe myself as a white woman. My pronouns are she and her. And my most salient visual feature is my gray and white hair. And that's because I pull that out, not what I'm wearing or what my background is, because I've been in the space for a long time. And that's one of the reasons I put all these books in, because when I started, this is how we had to look up laws. But now we don't have to anymore. Um, we have Section 504 and 508 in the United States, and 504 is about if the federal government is spending money, it has to spend it in a way that includes everybody. Again, what to put in the pocket is that really the ADA, accessibility, the law, all these laws, is about inclusion or exclusion. So 504 is federal government's going to spend money, they have to spend it in a way that everyone can benefit from. Section 508, federal government's going to purchase things, has to purchase things that work for everybody. There's the Communication and Vis uh, Video Accessibility Act that has accessibility provisions. There's Section 1557 of the Air Carriers Access Act. There are state laws. Um, the state laws kind of mirror the ADA. They're, not every state has them, but the ones that do are anti-discrimination, effective communication, and also state-funded. So wherever you are, you have to know what what the law is in the state that you're working in, um, and also state procurement, if the state, like little 508s, they call them. Um, and then the global laws, there's increasingly laws around the world recognizing that accessibility is fundamental to inclusion. There's a Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities that over 175 countries have signed. I have a resource on my website that um, tries to keep up with the international work and I also list a couple other resources. So if you, it's in the most looked at articles or you can find it through the legal, legal update section. Um, if any of you are from another country and want to send me information to keep my pages up, I really invite that the page is only successful because generous people have sent me what's happening in their country. So this is, we are part, we're sitting here in one conference in Anaheim or out there live streaming. I don't know where the camera is, but out there live streaming. Um, but this is a global movement. This is not just some idea that some lawmakers had in the US to make accessibility. No, this is a global movement powered by people with disabilities and allies who understand the inclusion, um, exclusion issue. So, um, okay, so what are possible legal remedies? All these laws have certain remedies. And the first one is you have to fix the problem and build accessible. So here I have an image of two signs. One is proactive, one says reactive. If you're proactive and you fix the problem and you build accessible, then you don't get to these other things because you probably won't get a legal action. The other things are, if you do get a legal action, and all, each law has their own kind of remedies, we don't have time to dive into each of them, but sometimes you have to pay money to the person who's harmed. Sometimes you have to pay a disabled person's attorney's fees and you have to pay your own lawyer. You have to report progress. Instead of just doing your own business or your own whatever, you have to report out because you have a legal violation. Um, you might have to pay government fines if the Department of Justice is doing it or you might have government oversight. So this is why 
I'm taking out all these other things except fix the problem, because if you're proactive, that's all you have to do. But if you're reactive and you wait for the lawyer to come knocking, you might have to do these other things about paying money, reporting progress. So um, I recommend proact. I recommend proactive. Um, okay, so the laws. We have civil rights ideas. Hopefully that's in your pocket. We have the laws that incorporate those civil rights and aren't some hammer from on high. Hopefully that's in your pocket. But the laws have to be implemented. Otherwise, still the unbaked cookie dough, which actually looks quite delicious to eat as is. It's a close-up of the dough with the chocolate chips. Um, so there's four ways laws are implemented in the United States. The first is often forgotten, which is every single day people with disabilities are advocating without lawyers to enforce their rights. And that's why I have an image of a woman sitting in a wheelchair on a phone, and I'm just imagining her texting customer service somewhere saying, I can't find this, I can't use this, it wasn't designed right. So leadership companies know that they should be reviewing their customer, you can call them complaints, or you can call them civil rights comments or civil rights enforcements, because people aren't gonna call up and say, well, you have a WCAG 2.1, you know, section this, that, or the other thing. They're gonna call up and say they can't do something, they can't find something, they can't see something, they can't hear something. Those are golden gifts to an organization to be proactive. And it's not just about lawyers who are enforcing things, it's about disabled people's advocacy. There's government agency activity, primarily in the US Department of Justice, but also Department of Ed, other departments. There's individual lawsuits, and then there's structured negotiations. So I want to go to recent legal actions in the digital accessibility space. Um, again, recent is highlighted in my celery color, just like update was highlighted, because we're only talking about a few things that I think are worth sharing and worth following. Um, there's a lot out there in the legal space and there's a lot more cases than this. So one of them is making COVID websites accessible. There's been good work by the US Department of Justice on um, making sure government websites about COVID information are accessible. Good work with uh, DOJ and the US Attorney in New York. I think they did five settlements in New York City, New York State. And then the Department of Justice has also been doing cases with private companies, um, websites that have vaccine information. So I have a resource on my website. Um, you can find it in the Legal Update tab, but I have the full link here, which is lflegal.com, 2021 forward slash 10 forward slash DOJ dot, sorry, DOJ dash digital. And there I have these cases, and then every time there's a new DOJ activity, I put it in that website. If you really want to try to keep up with what's happening in the legal space, um, I go to Twitter first because it's quicker. And I usually will put up what's happening and maybe a link to an article. It takes me a while to get to the website. So um, there's that. So making COVID websites accessible, um, obviously civil right to crucial health information in the pandemic time. All of these things are civil rights. So you can think as, okay, why, do we, why are we talking about COVID websites? as an ADA issue? Well, because access to health information, what could be more, first of all, personal and private? What could be more important? And what could be more about inclusion in society is information to keep you alive and safe. So that's happening. Um, other things in health tech, I, I put this hashtag health tech because I think we should all be trying, if we're tweeting about accessibility, figuring out a way we can get into some mainstream tweets. Thing. So if you're tweeting about education accessibility, you know, hashtag ed tech or hashtag health tech. So um, Jenny Le Fleury recently did a talk. She's chief accessibility officer of Microsoft. And one of her top five things was we got to get on other stages. I love being on this stage. I love talking to our community and creating, helping create the community that we all do. We got to get on other stages. Um, so that's why I titled this more hashtag health tech. Uh, talking prescription labels is something that I've worked on for a long time um, with the American Council of the Blind. And the image here is from CVS. It's a snapshot of its website um, that says, hi, it's your prescription talking. 
and CVS is one of many companies um, who, in part because of structured negotiation, in part because of advocacy by the community, in part because of great work by Envision America over many years who makes the Script Talk product, um, CVS is one of the companies most recently announced that within their app is their talking label reader. So I invite you to check that out. It's been one of the win-wins of structured negotiation over the years. Walmart did a great structured negotiation on talking labels earlier on. Um, University of North Carolina Healthcare System is an ongoing case. I'm putting it here just as a reminder to anyone in the healthcare space that look at all the information that healthcare organizations give out and think, is that being effectively communicated to people who are blind or people who are online and don't use a mouse. So we don't need an amendment to get to that as a civil right. And also, um, there's a big case going on against Quest kiosks, which are kiosks, it's like a lab, and you go in and you put in information and get information in these kiosks, and they're not designed with accessibility. So um, I have a resource for that. On my website, I have an article about kiosks. It includes all the legal cases about kiosks for the past four or five years, including this Quest case. So it was started in 2018, forward slash 01, forward slash kiosk 18. Um, I don't know why I named it kiosk 18, because it started in 18, but meanwhile, now it's updated, and um, every time something happens there uh, in the kiosk space, I update it. Higher ed cases, it's another thing that Accessibility is a civil right to education, to learning. Many cases, two I'm gonna pull out, the Los Angeles Community College District, there's a case by blind students who are um, asking for and needing and have a civil right to accessible course, course information and websites, and that recently got a lot of attention. I direct you to the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund website, dreadf.org, and they have a LACCD explainer. Explains the whole case in very easy to understand terms. There was a threat recently that it might go to the Supreme Court, which at this Supreme Court is not a good Supreme Court to take accessibility issues to, but the Disability Community Advocacy and the LACCD Board of Directors agreed not to take it to the Supreme Court. There's a recent case, University of Illinois Chicago. Again, it was in structured negotiation done by Equip for Equality in Chicago. And I gotta start talking a little faster. I thought I had so much time with 55 minutes. Um, I like that case because it was a blind employee, students, public, and structured negotiation is a process where you can be flexible and bring in everyone who's impacted by lack of access. So there's a great resource, I have it at bit.ly forward slash higher ed law, and it's a website that Laura Carlson at University of Minnesota keeps of all the accessibility cases in higher ed. So if you're in higher ed, that's the place to go. Um, there's cases around licensing exams and courses happening. There's a case pending against the California Insurance Agents License Exam where the contractor and the state got sued. There's a recent case that was resolved with ADP, um, which is an employment case. I tried to pick out a few cases from each sector. Uh, this is important because a lawsuit was filed against ADP because their HR software didn't work for blind people. But then the parties pivoted to structured negotiation, to collaboration within the lawsuit, to say, okay, we needed a lawsuit, but do we really have to fight about it, or can we sit down? And I am in honor of all the parties to that case, because they did sit down, and they did reach an agreement. I have an article about this on my site. You can search ADP, you can read the agreement, and one of the things about the agreement, it covered web, it covered mobile, and it specifically said that the uh, ADP would not use overlays in order to meet the obligation. Um, and I have a resource on overlays in a bit, but um, it specifically called out two overlays, audio I and accessibility written into the agreement says they can't be used to meet the obligations. So um, a few other overlay things that are happening. Uh, there was, there's many, I don't want to get derailed into overlays, but there's a lot of legal action where websites get sued because they're using overlays, not because they're using overlays, but they get sued because they're not accessible. 
the sites are using overlays and the overlays haven't fixed it. So there's a case uh, with IBOBs where there's a settlement that overlay was accessibility. There's one with Yield Street that overlay was UserWay, and there's one with US Wings that was with accessibility. So these are all public information that you can find. I have this illustrated with the Bugs Bunny saying no because that's an image I use on my article that's overlay-legal-update, which I update whenever there's a legal issue around overlays. So a um, couple other things, cases, employment, um, accessibility for deaf employees. I show here two black men smiling and signing in sign language. Um, there was a settlement that the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, did with Walmart um, about not having a sign language interpreter for job interview. And there's a pending case against the Society for Human Resource Management. Someone asked me about that yesterday, but there it is, about professional education materials. So again, every aspect of our lives are now digital, which means every digital thing is part of inclusion or exclusion. This case is about remote work, um, internal systems, federal government, and private sector. There's cases, settlements, and um, mostly settlements, some lawsuits around audio description. If you haven't seen the ACB Audio Description Award Gala program this year, it's online, American Council of Blind. I really recommend it. It was very gratifying to see how far this audio description issue has come over many years. So I invite you to check that out. Podcast accessibility. There was a case I reported on for the last couple of years. Spotify was sued about accessibility for not having accessible podcasts. Whatever happened to that, we don't know because some type of lawsuits being filed today don't have transparency. I consider transparency to be an ethical aspect of doing these kinds of cases because they affect so many people. But I'm happy to say that now the National Association of the Deaf is doing a case with SiriusXM and um, we, will get a, we will know what happens in that case. What's happened so far is they filed the lawsuit, and again, they pivoted to structured negotiation. They're trying to work it out. They're in a 120-day period right now to work it out with Sirius about captions. So um, there's cases about exercise equipment. Planet Fitness did an announcement about making the digital aspects of their equipment accessible. There was a big fine by the FCC about captioning on Pluto TV. Then there's Winn-Dixie and Domino's, which I don't want to spend too much time on because honestly it's like this, a ball of yarn, which is, you know, to me, it's just like a, it's been a procedural mess. Winn-Dixie is pretty much really over. I've written about Winn-Dixie. If you're not familiar with it, you can go on my website. Domino's Pizza, believe it or not, is still going on in the lower court. They haven't been able to settle it. There might be a trial later this year. Um, and Patreon and Discord I mentioned because those are the most recent structured negotiations that I've done that talk not just about the WCAG but also about the authoring tool accessibility guidelines. So I saved, I think, my favorite case for the last part of the cases, which is a $66 million website case. How many of you have not heard me talk about this case? Okay, well, the image of this is one of my favorite images, which is a woman holding up a pile of money that's on fire. Because to me, first of all, forget the accessibility, you're paying $66 million for a website? Like, that's, I don't know that much about. Um, it was California State Reservation System website, and they paid $66 million. They were supposed to get accessible, and they didn't. So there's a case being brought by, um, by two civil rights lawyers. Um, under the False Claims Act, which is a federal law, they have them in some states, that says you can't lie to get a federal contract or a state contract. If you're gonna say something's accessible, it better be accessible or you're making a false claim. So that case is winding its way. The contractor, apologies for the typo there, the contractor was sued, the web developer was sued, the subcontractor on the project was sued. Um, named USE Direct. So I'm really following that one because if we can tackle the procurement piece, you know, people buying things, they think it's accessible, it isn't accessible. Um, I do a lot of work with Disability In, which is a business to business corporate uh, disability inclusion organization. And we have a great accessible procurement toolkit with lots of ideas about contract language and training and the legal issues and all that. So 
this is kind of a procurement case because the system was broken somewhere that they got this website. So what are we being aware of? Beware with an exclamation point over the two jumping dolphins. So beware of the overlay. I said that already. Um, if you're not familiar with the overlay issue, which when we're using the word overlay, we're talking about one line of code that promises full ADA compliance with no effort. Those of you in the space, I will not ask for raise hands, know that accessibility takes effort. I've been in the space since 1995. I know it takes effort. So if you're not familiar with the issue, there's two resources. One is the overlayfactsheet.com, which is a statement that's been signed by over 600 people, including myself, about these overlays and a lot of media, a lot of articles. Most important, you know, people always want to talk to me, well, Lainey, can I convince you of this, that, or the other thing? I'm like, I listen to blind people, to disabled people, and to technical experts. I'm the communicator of this issue, and on this overlay factsheet.com, you can see all the writings by everyone who's written on this, including a couple articles I've written, as well as media, and there's a new one called the Overlay False Claims, um, overlayfalseclaims.com, so I have to put the big red X on beware of the overlay. Beware of a focus on websites only. You know, the law is still talking about websites and finally talking a little bit about mobile apps. I mean, I did the first negotiation uh, to make an accessible mobile app with Major League Baseball in 2008. Thus the white hair, see? How long ago was that? And still, the law is still kind of, well, does this part of the United States cover apps or doesn't it? I mean, technology is going a lot faster than the law is. So in your organizations, when you're thinking about the law, you can't just be thinking, well, the law is talking about websites, so that's all we have to think about. No, there's other things beyond web, mobile, kiosks, and software. There's the metaverse, XR, Augmented reality, virtual reality. There's Web3, which I'm now going to say two words. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> NFTs and blockchain. NFT and blockchain. But I know this. They have to be accessible. Because otherwise, disabled people are going to be excluded from this. So I have a couple resources for those of you, including myself, who really need to know more about this. XRaccess.org is a wonderful place to get information. Um, the w3.org forward slash tr forward slash xaur, these are the people who wrote the WCAG. They also have resources on XR Access. I apologize, I should have put up here Pete Works, P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S. They do a lot of good work around XR. And then there is a blog by a woman named Crystal Preston Watson, and it's called A11Y Savvy. Dot com. And she wrote the first thing I've seen about accessibility of Web3, and she kind of explains it, and she even in her research bought an NFT to really look at the accessibility issues. So my hat's off to Crystal, and I think we need to pay attention to this because this is going to be a place of inclusion and exclusion. And we can get in, I mean, it's not even the front of the XR thing, but we can, we can get in early and not, like we're talking about websites, which part of me feels... Are there even going to be websites by the time the law finally says, oh, yeah, websites, you know, always have to be accessible. So beware of silos. Silos are a big impediment to accessibility. And by certain, why I have a big yellow X on them and this very nice picture of old-fashioned farm silos, red and white, in a nice field. Because accessibility takes a lot of effort by everybody in the cookie. So if your developers aren't talking to your designers, if your designers don't understand that accessibility starts with design, accessibility starts with the idea of design, and you're not talking to your HR people about buying accessible tools, and the procurement people never heard about accessibility, then all good work in one silo is really limiting the organization's capacity to do good work everywhere. So beware silos. This, beware the numbers. Okay, and most of the legal talks that people give start with how many lawsuits are filed. I, I'm not that interested in that. There's a lot. Can I leave it at that? There's thousands of lawsuits and demand letters being filed. And I, I have an open heart to people who get one and don't get any explanation and don't get to meet a disabled client. 
but it can be a real distraction to think about the numbers because that creates a feeling of fear. Oh my God, we have to do this because we have to avoid one of these lawsuits. We don't want to be number 3,982. And accessibility should be something that we are proud to live in a country and live in a world where civil rights are recognized of people with disabilities. So it's good to keep track of the numbers, but I really feel like we should, you know, it shouldn't be the driver. The numbers shouldn't be the driver. So, but if you like the numbers, I feel obligated to tell you that um, the two resources I use are the Usable Net Report, it's Usable Net, you can look it up, dot .com and .org, and the SafeArth, which is a law firm ADA Title III blog. So, you know, you can slice and dice it, you find out who gets sued, companies that use overlays, companies that don't use overlays, developers who deliver inaccessible product, experts with bad advice, site and app owners, anyone with low hanging barriers. So the numbers are there, but um, more important to talk about is how to avoid lawsuits. And so then we get to talk about the cookie again, because the other part of the cookie is all the things that are necessary to have a robust accessibility program. So hiring disabled people is number one, because disabled people must be involved in every aspect of or And what I mean by that is not just testers, not just contract testers brought in at the end. And, and you know, it's, for me, having been in this space for a long time, it's so encouraging. I won't pull out company names, but you know who they are really doing a good job on this. You know, seeing more and more people with disabilities in various roles within the organization to make sure accessibility happens. So that is really key. And to tell you the truth, I always, of course, knew inclusive hiring is critical, but it wasn't until I did that uh, session at CSUN with the Microsoft lawyer and we had the cookies, where she said, you know, a key ingredient is having disabled people everywhere because if your colleague is deaf, less likely you're gonna screw up and forget the captions. If your colleague is blind, less likely you're gonna screw up and forget the alt text. So hiring disabled people, transparency, testing and training, ethics, design, development, procurement, collaboration. To me, these are all the cookie elements that go into accessibility. I do whole talks on just this one slide. We can't do that here, but I can tell you that the law is a piece of it. The law is assault. This is what I say, because those of you who are bakers know you can't get a sweet cookie without the salt, but if you have too much salt, the cookie is kind of wrecked. So if all your focus is on law and the legal cases, you know, you need to know them, and hopefully I, there are a few that you now have in your pocket that you didn't before. Um, but don't let it be the driver. So how should we talk about law? First, a couple things to share on that. This is playing the Jaws theme. Because sharks create fear. And when people think about the law as, and think about lawyers as sharks, which actually is in Moby Dick about lawyers being sharks, then the whole idea of the capital crawl and why we have the ADA to begin with is completely lost. So talk about the law without fear. Instead, talk about the law with a collaborative mindset and language of a dolphin. So I have two images to share here. Um, this is a picture of two dolphins who are smiling and happily eating fish that they managed to get out of this plastic tube. How? by collaborating, by communicating, by working together to solve a problem. And that's what we ideally can use a law as foundational to say, hey, you know, there's a law out there that recognizes disabled people have a right for inclusion. Let's work together and make it happen. And the other one is this. This is a picture of a cat looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. And I'm always encouraging people to find the lion because every organization, whatever you're in, sees themselves in a certain way. And our job is to show how accessibility is part of diversity and inclusion, is part of privacy and security, is part of people first, customer delight. We are actually part of everything. 
And if we just talk about the law as some outside thing, that's an obligation that we have a checkbox and have to go to the legal department, which often creates problems. No, we have to show how accessibility is part of how the organizations see themselves. So real quick on dolphin qualities, a few dolphin qualities. Empathy, which is not sympathy. Empathy to me is the understanding of the impact of our work when we design and create without accessibility, what it means to experience barriers. Equanimity, not getting all riled up when talking about the law and yelling and screaming, you know, being able to calmly present and be a pillar as the winds are blowing. Active patience, things take time. I write about all these things in my book for anyone curious, but I, I really can't leave a legal talk without kind of sharing some of these ways because you are all advocates. You are all going to be in conversations. Why don't we do this? Can't we do this? So having the qualities of being able to communicate, to listen, to be optimistic, to be kind and friendly and to listen and to have trust and model the trust that we want to have, to be curious about what's holding people back, what is their fears, to not have assumptions. So the, to the, the session, the topic slide here was how do we talk about the law? The last one is with these ideas. This is an image from Disabled in Here, which is a great stock photo site of black women sitting um, in an office setting, one's using a wheelchair, one's on a cane, and having a conversation with these ideas. Civil rights, these are the pocket ideas fitting in the watch pocket. Accessibility is civil rights. Accessibility is privacy and security. Accessibility is diversity, inclusion, and belonging. It's independence. It's good for business. And finally, accessibility is delicious. And I have my blueberry muffins here, and I have the article title is There's an article on my website called Accessibility is Delicious with a lot of food metaphors for when you are using your dolphin qualities to communicate and advocate about the law in a collaborative way. So I invite you to check that out. I invite you to stay in touch. On the closing slide, I have a picture of my book. It's called Structured Negotiation, a Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. I did bring a couple copies for anyone interested. I'm excited with the second edition that came out in October. It has a preface by Habit Gurma, who's a friend of mine. If you haven't read her book called Hobbin, the First Deaf-Blind Woman to Conquer Harvard Law, I recommend it times 10. Uh, she did a uh, she did a forward, and Jenny Lay Fleury, Chief Accessibility Officer at uh, Microsoft, did a cover quote. So I appreciate that. I have on here my contact information. Please reach out to me, Twitter, at LFLegal, lflegal.com forward slash contact. I have an email list. Last year, I sent three emails on it. <laughs> so I'm trying to do better this year, but it's very low traffic, no matter what. Um, I do public speaking, lflegal.com forward slash speaking, and my email is lf at lflegal.com. And we have seven minutes and seven seconds for questions. Does anyone have? Front row, hands up. You know, I, I, it's funny, I said that on that slide about experts getting sued, and as I said it, I'm like, I need to double check. There is a case against GNC, and the reason the company lost is because they had a bad expert. But I'm not sure the expert got sued. So I really, oh. Yeah, the question, the question is, um, has an expert gotten sued? And I know I said that on the slide, and as I said it, I was thinking, I really should double check that. There was a case um, against GNC, and they put up an expert to defend the case, and they lost the case because the judge basically said the expert wasn't good enough and hadn't, didn't really understand. The real message is, and the same thing with some of the overlay cases. You know, they bring up an expert to say, well, this overlay uh, made the site accessible. But in the iBob's case, which I referenced, there's a big affidavit 
by an expert. So if you are in a legal situation, you do need an expert. You really have to have someone who really understands accessibility from the inclusion and the WCAG, and it's a really important piece. Structured negotiation, I have a chapter in my book about experts. I, one reason I love it is because we're not talking about fighting experts. We're talking about let's bring experts to the table to solve the problem. And most often, the best experts are the people with disabilities experiencing the barriers. So if you are using the structure negotiation elements in a collaborative setting at work, you know, you're not talking about a legal thing, it's like, hey, who can we bring in here to help explain the problem? And I did a talk recently that was kind of about that side of things, and I shared this, which was, um, and actually this is in the book, that when I inter we did a uh, negotiation with credit reporting companies, they've been great partners in making sure credit reports are accessible. So I interviewed for the book a lot of lawyers who represented the big companies. And I said to this woman, well, what do you, it was like six years after the case. And she said, I remember your client, Lori Gray. I remember she couldn't read Braille because she had neuropathy and she needed audio. I will never forget her, and no one in my company will forget her either. I had someone last week tell me that the biggest, she used a swear word, we're on TV here, so, you know, the biggest moment of her career was seeing a blind person use a Braille display on their website and how the barriers were. So if you need expertise to convince somebody of something, don't talk, you know, show, don't tell. Let's have another question. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, thank you for that. I didn't really talk too much about Title I. The question was, what about internal systems like Slack? I didn't hear the other ones you mentioned, but you know, that's part of the whole procurement thing, that we have to make sure that procurement is done correctly and that everyone in the process of procurement knows. I mean, Title I, the employment part of the ADA is more individu you know, individual accommodations. So how does tech access fit into individual accommodations? I'm very glad to say, I know from working with Disability In that the large companies are really growing in their commitment to making sure these products are accessible and want to hear from people. This is, you know, the thing about the disabled person texting customer service. So um, yeah, they, there are cases, there's been a couple employment cases on systems. The ADP case is a good example of that. That's an HR system that, as I said, there was a lawsuit, but then there was a structured negotiation. So I think, we're gonna, I think we're gonna see more of those in the legal space, but also as the law, the law as foundational for organizations to understand they need to do it. And also because of the pandemic, and I mean, I do believe that there has been a greater focus than I've ever seen on the importance of accessibility because of the pandemic and everyone working at home. So that's a good question and we should keep our eyes on it. I think we have time for one more. <laughs> TVs are usually covered under the CVAA, the Communications and Video Accessibilities Act. Again, like I know that Comcast, they have a good uh, their hardware is accessible, they have a good accessibility program. So I th I'm not really an expert on the CVAA, but I know you can, that's, the government agency is the FCC there and you can file a complaint. So I, I mean, honestly, between, everything's digital. And as Jeff Whistle, the Chief Accessibility Officer of Disability In says, accessibility is at the intersection of everything. And so, because accessibility is an inclusion in civil rights, I wouldn't be surprised of any area that doesn't come into the legal focus, which is why the proactive piece is so important. I had a hard stop at nine. Does anyone have like a one second question? Okay, well then I'm gonna say thank you and I appreciate. All right, enjoy the rest of the conference, thank you.